Right. Um, yes, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I want to mention that this is a joint work with Pedro Moreno Sanchez, um, Aniket Kate, Matteo Maffei, and Sri Vatsan Radu. So um, let me start off with a bit of introduction. I think by, by now we should all be convinced that uh, cryptocurrency is something that is worth to look into. So, uh, but, but this still has some sort of limitation with respect to the traditional banking credit cards approach. Um, for example, a network like Visa network can process uh, up to 47,000 transactions per second, whereas uh, Bitcoin network at today has a throughput of less than 10 transactions per second. Um, this is not inherent to any to every cryptocurrency, but this is the way it is now. Um, also, micropayments do, do not really work in Bitcoin due to the high transactions fee. Um, so this undermines a lot the, the scalability of the of the Bitcoin network. Uh, a solution that has been proposed in literature towards this extent is, the, as we saw in the talk before, payment channel. And for those of you who missed it, I am just going to give a brief introduction of what a payment channel is. Um, the idea behind payment channel is to enable multiple subsequ subsequent payment between two users without um, uploading every single payment to a blockchain, thereby incurring in the um, in the uh, overhead due to the consensus network consensus protocol. And in our toy example here, we imagine that we have two users, Alice and Bob, and the first steps towards opening a payment channel is to put money in a deposit with an online uh, on-chain transactions. And this deposit has a timestamp that says that if nothing has happened, nobody has redeemed the coin after this point in time, before this point in time, the whole fund will go back to the Alice's account. Um, now, Alice, instead of doing direct transaction to Bob, she can just send signed transaction in an off chain way, so in, by any other means of communication, that says that um, a certain amount of funding will go to Alice's account and a certain amount of funding will go to Bob's account. And whenever there is more, um, the more than one transaction, Bob does not need to upload the um, each stage of the trans of, of the chain of the transaction, but he can simply uh, wait until the channel is about to expire. Those transactions are effectively payment. So um, so you can just upload the last one and then redeem all the money that Alice is owes him. And so keep in mind that here the efficiency comes from the fact that um, there are, there are multiple transactions between between two users. Um, so, as we said before, um, opening one payment channel for each pairs of users does not really um, scale. Also, you require it requires a lot of money to to um, to be performed. So, this is why it is desirable to have uh, payment channel networks as opposed to single payment channels. And in payment channel networks, the idea is to do multi-hop payments. Now. Throughout this talk, you're going to see only one hop payment, but just keep in mind that everything that I say here, at least for our paper, it generalizes to, um, to n hops and in more in general to any peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and the idea is, is very simple. Um, to perform a payment from Alice to, to Cat, you just give one Bitcoin to Bob and then wait until Bob sends this Bitcoin to Cat. Um, this, as I said, increases scalability of of, of networks even further. There are obvious uh, trust issues when you implement this, this this mechanism naively. So if you just hope that Bob um, will give his Bitcoin to Cat, there is an obvious attack because Bob could just withhold and effectively increase his funds by one Bitcoin. So what, what we would like to achieve here is some sort of um, atomicity of the transaction. So in a nutshell, this means that we want the path to be updated atomically. So either all the payment channels belongs, belonging to that path are updated or none of them is. Okay, this is, um, this is what we would like to achieve. So let, let's take a look at the tool that current proposal for payment channel network uses to achieve atomicity. Here I'm referring to uh, one specific implementation of payment channel network, which is the Lightning Network. And, but keep in mind that there might be other solutions. This is just one way of doing that, okay? So um, the idea here is very simple. They, they use um, what is called a hash time lock contract, we're, which we're going to address as HTLC for short, which says that um, Bob can redeem a certain transaction for one Bitcoin in this case, only if he provides a valid pre-image 
for a certain value of a hash function, where the hash function here can be anything, and for example, in Bitcoin, it's going to be our uh, SHA-256, and Bob has to, has to come up with a valid x such that h of x is equal to y before a certain point in time, which we set, um, which set to be 30 days, after which the transaction is no longer valid. So now Bob, given this contract, can take his x, assuming that he knows it, of course, upload this thing to the blockchain. The blockchain can simply verify whether x is equal to, h of x is equal to y by recomputing the hash. And if this is the case, just um, sends the money to Bob's deposit. Okay, so how does this help to ensure atomicity? So now, instead of just sending one Bitcoin to Bob, the first thing that we do is we initialize the random value of x and we compute the corresponding image y. Um, now, instead, as I said, to, of doing, of doing the, the, the naive thing, Alice can simply um, send an HTLC contract to Bob, which says that I will transfer one Bitcoin to Bob if Bob will be able to, um, to provide a valid pre-image of, of Y in within 30 days. Know that at this point in time, Bob cannot redeem the payment yet because the, the hash, uh, the, sorry, the value of X is currently unknown to him. Um, now Bob does exactly the same, except that now instead of 30 days, he's, he puts a lower value, let's say, let's say 29 days. And at this point in time, the cat sees that he, he receives enough money, so the cat does not necessarily need to know where the payment went through. It just sees that he received enough money, so at this point in time, he can release the value of X. And if the value of X is released, obviously the the funds from, uh, from Bob to the cat can be pulled. And notice that um, as long as uh, we set the, um, the, the, the um, closing time for the HTLC properly, Bob does not lose money either. So this is, this is to avoid like race conditions, okay? So more specifically, um, if, if the cat would just wait until the very last second to publish X, then Bob would not manage to read it and his channel was, would close. In this case, he has still one day to do it, so, so everything is fine. Now, this, this, all these things that I've been telling you is just the state of the art. So things how it is, this is not our, our work, we, this is our point of start. So what we did in our paper is the following. We provided a formal, a formal characterization of, of payment channel networks and their security guarantees um, uh, in terms of uh, universal composability, uh, for those of you who, who are familiar with the framework. Then we provide um, a new methodology to achieve anonymity via uh, for, for payment channel network. I'm going to elaborate on that soon. Then we studied for the first time uh, concurrency uh, in payment channel network, and we provide a prototype implementation to show the uh, feasibility of our results. So for the first um, for the first part, let, let me just mention that we uh, modeled payment channel network and the security guarantee guarantees in the UC framework. I'm not going to elaborate more on this. Uh, I'm just going to extract the interesting property. And for those of you who are interested in seeing the, how the formalization is done, I refer to the paper. Also happy to accept questions afterwards. But the idea here, so why do we use the UC framework? Because the, the, way, the way we model security, that's the only way we can model security in, in, in the in presence of concurrent transactions, on co concurrent uh, scenarios. So that's the only, uh, the only um, generic framework that allows us to do it, so we used it. Uh, so for the sake of this talk, let me extract the security and privacy properties that we believe to be uh, of interest in payment channel network. So the, the ideal functionality that we designed, FPCN, are, underlines the following. So for as far as security is concerned, we identify the main notion of security as balanced security. Balanced security is a weak uh, version of atomicity, where atomicity I, I explained before, and essentially says that each intermediate user, as long as he's, um, as he's behaving honestly, will not lose money in the process. It, it is weaker with respect to anonymity, be, uh, sorry, to the atomicity, because atomicity says that all, um, all the path has to change atomically, whereas in this case, it could be possible that, um, uh, that at some point the adversary just decides to terminate. But we just guarantee that every honest user um, the area of security does not lose money in this process, which we believe to be sufficient, and this also allows us to um, have um, 
meaningful anonymity guarantees. For serializability, we require that um, a set for any given set of concurrent transactions, there exists a set of serial transactions which are successful with the same outcome. Um, this essentially says that um, having concurrent transactions does not mess up with the, secure, with, the, with the correctness of the network, so the adversary cannot just create a set of uh, concurrent transactions just to create output that would not be possible otherwise. So for the privacy properties that we, that we believe to be of interest is the first is value privacy that says that to an external observer, two transactions uh, for different value shall be indistinguishable. Um, notice that this is essentially as good as it gets. One might consider a stronger notion where also intermediate users in the path are corrupted, but this, this means that you want to prevent a user from knowing the balance of his own links, which is not really, uh, not really what we want. I mean, you could imagine settings where this is meaningful, but in general, we, we don't consider that. Um, whereas instead, for relationship anonymity, we want to consider anonymity also with respect to intermediate corrupted user. And you can imagine the, the uh, intermediate honest node there to act sort of as a mixer, so um, that the two uh, corrupted, um, corrupted guys cannot backtrace uh, the origin of a certain transaction. And more specifically, um, the, 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 the corrupted user at the very end of this, of this path cannot tell whether P0 or P1 was the transaction belonging to the, to the top sender or to the, to the bottom sender. Um, so this is as far as anonymity is concerned. Um, it is a pervasive idea, so it's easy to, to say that um, um, since everything is happening off-chain, anonymity is, is, is preserved, which is not the case. And it's easy, again, to, to, um, to find a counterexample for this. As long as the value of y, which recall it is the, um, the HTLC value, so the image of the hash function, is exactly the same throughout the path, it's very easy to link transactions among each other. Right? So we have to do something about it. And, and keep in mind that this was the same value that guarantees the atomicity of the transaction. So we, 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 off, we obviously want to keep that property, but at the same time we want to um, we would like to guarantee some sort of meaningful notion of anonymity inside this, this payment channel network. So how do we do this? Um, and th the first thought that, that, that we had is like, okay, throw some crypto at it, right? So it will work. And eventually it does because it's not an impossible problem. Um, the more challenging part is to make it compatible with all system that we know. Because if you start going crazy there using fancy uh, modular arithmetic lattices, whatever, then, then you end up with some very complicated formula which is difficult to verify and in particular cannot be um, verified by the current implementation of Bitcoin. For example, in Ethereum that would work, um, but, but as to the best of our knowledge, uh, Bitcoin script language that today can roughly, uh, it, it is roughly limited as verifying hash function and computing signatures. So these are the tools that, that, we can, that we can use to solve this problem. Right? Um, so our solution is, is we, we call multi-hop HTLC and we leverage non-interactive zero-knowledge proof to achieve anonymity. And the idea is that it is true that we are very limited in the, in the computation that we, we can do on the chain, but on the other end, off-chain, the two, the two peers, whoops, whoops. The two peers could go crazy, could just go do whatever they want. And in fact, everything that is happening in our, everything interesting that is happening in our protocols happens off-chain, so between the two users. Whatever is, in, is happening on-chain is just standard HTLC contract. So as long as HTLC, HTLC contract work, then also our solution works. And yeah, we stress that this, um, that this is fully compatible with, uh, with the current version of Bitcoin. So it, can just use this today, and it, it, it works, it's at least correct and secure. Um, okay, so let me just give um, a quick uh, introduction to our solution. So as again, I want to stress that I present only for, for, for a single hop, but this this easily generalizes to, to n hops for, for any arbitrary n, and I think you're, you, you'll be able to see, to see how it goes. 
Um, so now instead of a single value of x, we, um, we initialize two different values uh, of x0 and x1, which are uniformly distributed in the domain of the, of the function h. Then we, um, I hope you can see, we um, compute h1 and h0 as the hash of x0 for, a, for, for y0 and the hash of x0, x0, x1 for y1. Now, the first step is, is uh, extremely simple. Alice can simply send a x0 and y0 to the cat, which just verify that this is a valid tuple by, um, by recomputing the hash function. The, the more tricky step is the, is the second one, where Alice sends x1, y0, y1, and pi to Bob. Now, pi is a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, uh, which I assume you to be familiar with, but you don't need to know how this is implemented. You don't really need to know what this is. What you need to know is that this guarantees that a certain statement holds true without revealing any additional information about this statement. And in particular, we, this, this pi shows that um, there exists an x0 such that x0, xor, x1 hash gives you y1, and the hash of x0 gives you y0. Um, so Bob can simply now uh, verify this proof, and uh, and then and then the, the 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 atomic payment works pretty much as before, except that we use the value of y0 and y1 um, for computing our HTLC contract. And you will see now why uh, why this sort of makes sense, at least to us. Um, so now the the first the first HTLC that has been that gets computed is from Alice to Bob, and it is again for one Bitcoin committed under the assumption that um, Bob will be able to um, find the valid preimage of y y one. Yeah, y one. So now note that that again at this point in time, Bob knows x one but does not know x zero. So at this point in time, he still cannot pull the payment, right? Um, and then the next step is that Bob produces the same HTLC contract, but under the value of Y0. As far as the, um, as the expiration times is concerned, we use the same strategy as before. Um, now the cat again sees whoops, that um, the, the, the value of one Bitcoin has reached there, so she can publish the value of um, x0, and note that when Bob learns the value of x0, it can simply XOR it with the value of x1 and learn a valid preimage of a hash, thereby being able to pull the payment. So why, why, what, what's the improvement of this with respect to the state of the art? The improvement is that, is that now y1 and y0, they are completely independent from each other. And in particular, if you take a look at the system of equation that arises from the three images of the hash function, you can clearly see that um, there are two equations and two unknowns. So those uh, those values are completely independent, so uniformly distributed in the in the domain of the hash. That means that this is as good as it gets in terms of anonymity, at least for for the value of of, of the y's. And for balance security, again, that's basically what I argued before. As soon as the cat publishes x0, then Bob um, publishes, can compute x0, x0, x1, thereby uh, learning a valid preimage for his own hash. And of course, this is conditioned to the fact that uh, all the values are computed honestly, but for this, we, re we rely on the soundness of the zero knowledge proof. So if the sender, so Alice, would be able to fool these two guys into, into accepting, um, non well formed inputs, then it would break the soundness of the zero knowledge proof file. Okay, so so much about anonymity. Now let me switch to the uh, concurrency part. So for the concurrency, um, our our observation is that whereas in standard uh, online payment system, miners can simply see all the transactions, therefore there is a trivial algorithm. They, they can just sort them, let's say, like lexicographically, so there is no real uh, challenge there in terms of concurrency. In, in distributed system, is, is the, the situation is different, right? Because nobody has a complete view of the network. So we have to, we have to, uh, to, to be a bit more careful there. 
And in particular, we identified two approaches towards concurrent payment. The first system that we call Fulgor, um, it, it implements blocking payment. Blocking payment is the standard solution that says that whenever a channel does not have enough capacity, I simply drop the, the payment. So I just, the payment just doesn't go through. Uh, this is easy to implement, is so, somewhat efficient, but it might lead to deadlock. Deadlocks would be the standard uh, example where two transactions keep blocking each other, whereas one could potentially go through, but when executed concurrency, concurrently, they block each other. And for this extent, we develop um, uh, um, another non-blocking solution, which we call Rio. And there, it is guaranteed that at least one transaction will go through in the set of uh, concurrent transaction for, for every set of payment channel. And interestingly enough, we show that uh, our solution, and sorry, uh, that any solution which is uh, non-blocking cannot achieve the same level of anonymity as blocking solution. And in particular, uh, we show that any, any non-blocking solution should be based on some global transaction ID that um, tri trivially link at least to the intermediate user um, which transaction they are processing, okay? So you can see a pictorial representation of the anonymity loss in this set uh, for the blocking solution to the two red guys. It is unclear whether the, the receiver um, for transaction P0 is the top or the bottom, whereas in the non-blocking solution, they can backtrace it and they can link each, uh, each receiver to, to each sender. Um, as far as implementation is concerned, the main bottleneck of our system is clearly the computation of the non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, which we implement using the framework ZKBU. Um, each proof requires approximately 300 milliseconds to be computed and, and 100 milliseconds to be verified, and its size is of approximately uh, one and a half megabytes. And so we, we showcase the, um, the, the efficiency of our system with, uh, with a five of payments, which we believe to be somewhat realistic in, in real life scenarios. And for the non-private, which we use the Lightning Network implementation for that, we have a running time of um, 600 milliseconds approximately, whereas our work can execute the same payment in approximately two seconds, and with an overhead, with a communication overhead of approximately five megabytes. And so this is, again, a trade-off between uh, privacy and, uh, and efficiency of the system. Okay, so let me get to the conclusion. So what we, what we, what we described today was um, an efficient method to perform anonymous payment in payment channel networks. We showed uh, perhaps surprising trade-off between privacy and concurrency in payment channel network, and we provide and propose a system which is fully compatible with the current version of Bitcoin scripting. So some open problems which we did not touch in this paper concern the routing of payment channel networks, so there are some ongoing work on this, but so we do not really tackle this problem, we just assume that it's done somehow. Um, another thing that we could look into is um, some other application for HTLC or even, even multi-hop HTLC. So with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank, thanks for your attention. So I was curious, um, how often do you see these kind of, do you think you see these kind of concurrency issues and things like that in the actual network or, or in these kind of off-chain? So I, I think at the state of today, you don't really see those issues uh, because of the, I mean, they are not, there is not a massive use of those, but um, I mean, it's unclear, right? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, in real life system, this, this would affect. I think it's still good to have uh, theoretical um, characterization of, of the properties that, that you lose in both cases. Thank you.